Holy Spirit. We understand that no one person or organization is capable of fulfilling that command alone. But we firmly believe that we must do our part. With that in mind, the Christian Motorcyclist Association has partnered with three other ministries and together we've been able to touch all but four nations of the world with the gospel message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Over the past 26 years, CMA has seen over 17 million people profess acceptance of Jesus Christ as a direct result of the outreaches funded by Run for the Sun. CMA is a ministry. We are not a fundraising organization. Run for the Sun is the only official fundraising effort that we're involved in, and we give away more than we keep. It is important to note that none of the money raised is used to fund the day-to-day -day operating expenses of CMA or our partner ministries. Of the money raised, CMA keeps 40%, which we use to reach out to bikers and others throughout the USA and around the world. We do this primarily by getting involved in rallies, events, and with various motorcycle organizations. We reach out in service and look for opportunities to let our light shine. We strive to demonstrate and share the unconditional love of Christ. Time doesn't permit me to fully explain the training and many tools that we've developed and make available to our members, but all are intended to reach out with the gospel of Christ to the hurting and to the lost. Very simply put, we follow the example of Christ when He said in Matthew 20, 28, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for men. Of the money raised, we give 20% to Missionary Ventures International. Through Missionary Ventures, CMA has been supplying motorcycles, bicycles, and other forms of transportation to indigenous pastors and evangelists around the world. To date, CMA has placed 4,779 motorcycles, 6,296 bicycles, 23 horses, 24 boats, one camel, and one horse and buggy to pastors working in 90 different countries. Many of the vehicles have gone to pastors and evangelists to assist them in planting new churches and going into new areas with the gospel. Typically, Every new church plant sees at least 100 people come to Christ within the first year. Statistics are difficult to calculate, but we have seen as many as 12 new churches being planted with the use of just one motorcycle. 20% of the money raised goes to the Jesus Film Project. The impact of the Jesus Film has been felt in jungles, deserts, and bustling cities throughout the world. The mission of the Jesus Film Project is to provide people with a life-changing encounter with Jesus through film. To date, the Jesus Film has been translated into 1,196 languages and shown in over 200 countries. CMA's partnership with the Jesus Film Project has made a huge impact in the lives of countless faithful Christians. Historically, for every dollar invested in the Jesus Film, at least 10 people worldwide see the film and one person accepts Christ. With these estimates in mind, approximately 93 million people have viewed the film and about 9.3 million people have made decisions for Christ, resulting from gifts to run for the sun. Through our partnership with the Jesus Film Project, CMA has helped train church planners, equip Jesus Film teams, provide new translations, equipment, film prints, DVDs, and vehicles that help get the good news to some of the most remote areas of the world. CMA was also the major contributor to one of the Jesus Film Project's newest films that is being used to reach women in very difficult and hard to reach areas. 20% of the money raised goes to Open Doors. Open Doors works in over 50 of the most oppressive, dangerous countries in the world strengthening persecuted Christians to stand strong and equipping them to shine Christ's light in these dark places. Open doors can be found often working covertly, supplying Bibles, training leaders, developing Christian communities, ensuring prayer, presence, and advocacy for persecuted Christians around the world. Open Doors works alongside an estimated 100 million Christians worldwide who suffer interrogation, arrest, persecution, and even death for their faith in Christ. CMA's partnership with Open Doors has made a huge impact 
in these lives. Since Run for the Sun began in the mid-80s, CMA, through its partnership with Open Doors, has distributed approximately 2,453,534 Bibles in many languages and supported the distribution of many other Christian resources to persecuted Christians around the world. The impact of Run for the Sun knows no boundaries. Through Run for the Sun, you can play a part in fulfilling the Great Commission. Together, we can change the world. As stated in the beginning, it is our belief that all Christians should do their part to help fulfill the Great Commission. CMA's Run for the Sun is a place where you can invest and know beyond any doubt that you will be participating in something that will result in someone's life being changed. You can touch someone somewhere in the world, but the choice is yours. On Saturday, May 3rd, 2014, CMA members across the United States and Canada will participate in the 26th annual Run for the Sun. Will you help us spread the light of Jesus around the world? Will you support Run for the Sun? You can make a difference. For every dollar donated to Run for the Sun, they believe that one person comes to Christ. You'll have an opportunity after service to donate. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Mike McBurney. <laughs> Just joking, no, I, I am Brett. Welcome to First Presbyterian. We're glad you're here this morning. A few announcements for me to get us going today. First one is our small groups continue tonight at 5.30 down in the rec center. Hope you can come out for that. There's also youth group tonight at 5.30, same time, upstairs. Um, and the food tonight is ice cream. So make your choices based on the food. That's important. Um, next one, the summer food program planning meeting following worship today is in room 117. Your bulletin says the library. That is not the case. If you can go to the library and look at books, but the summer food program meeting will be in room 116 right next door to the, or 117 right next door to the library. Next thing, Mission Possible is this Tuesday evening at 530. We'll be going to Golden Hill Nursing Home to spread some cheer and have a good time. This is always one of the best Mission Possibles of the year, so please come on. Hey, even if you don't have kids, if you want to come out with us to Golden Hill, we would love to have you. So 5.30 Tuesday evening. This Wednesday is our final Lenten luncheon at noon. The speaker is Bill McNeese, who's a teacher and a coach at Shenango High School. Um, so hopefully you can make some room in your schedule, come out to the final Lenten luncheon of the year. The Easter ex excellent Easter extravaganza is this coming Saturday at 9 o'clock. Everyone is welcome. We could still use some candy-filled plastic eggs. Don't take real eggs and fill them with candy. That would be bad. But if you can make some candy, some plastic eggs fill them with candy, we would really appreciate that. The one great hour of sharing offering will be accepted next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday during worship. You have an uh, insert in your bulletin today that gives you more information about that, so please check that out. Um, Glory Grill Easter dinner is Saturday, April 19th, and it's sponsored by the deacons. If you can help, see Ann Cochran or see any one of the deacons, and they will give you more information about times and what they need folks to do. Today is the final day to order Easter flowers. Um, if you can't place your order today, please send or drop off in the office some point during this week. So I guess today is not the final day to order Easter flowers. Maybe it's the last Sunday you can, but please fill that out today or bring it to the office this week. A um, couple sad pieces of information. Shirley Schreffler passed away on March 26th, and her memorial service is this Tuesday at 3 p.m. at the Haven Nursing Home. And Alice Kerr passed away yesterday, and her funeral will be Friday at 11 a.m. here in the church. So just wanted you all to know that so you can plan accordingly. That is all for me. Let's worship God.
please stand as you are able and join me in the responsive <laughs> call to worship. We come trusting in God's mercy and love, longing to know and to learn more about God's ways. We come to be guided in the ways of God's truth, to experience the joy of God's salvation. We make our Lenten journey aware of God's steadfast love, helping us to overcome life's trials and temptations. We give us God, to do what is right in our eyes, and teach us all the ways of Christ, through the love of the Son of our Lord. Let us worship God.
Let us confess our sins and receive his grace and forgiveness by praying the unison prayer confession, which is printed in the bulletin. Lord and Savior, we confess to you that life conscious tired, we too are weak. But when we have the opportunity to proclaim the truth, we give in to our fears of what others might think, choosing instead to wash our hands of our convictions. We want to follow you, but we confess our reliance to face the trials that the journey might hold. Forgive our sins and remind us that you are always in control and that all things will be accomplished according to your will. Continue your own prayers and confession in silence. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Friends, hear the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. As brothers and sisters in Christ, let us offer each other the sign of Christ's peace. be seated and any of the kids that haven't found their way on down here this is your cue it's a nice group of kids today if you guys had a good week raise your hand if you've had a good week all right raise your hands if you've been good all week uh are you telling the truth Yes. Raise your hand if you might not have been telling the truth. <laughs> wow, these kids are all good. Taishay's the only one who's completely honest. Good for you. What made your week good? Cole? Yeah, this, you did a great job today. Didn't Cole do a good job as Acolyte, huh? Yes. That was what made his week good. He was Acolyte, church. I love it. Claire, what made your week good? We did. We went last night to see Joel as the music man. It's a what? It's a what? He's a music man. You should all go. If you haven't seen it at Mohawk, it was really good. Today's the last day of it at 2 o'clock, I think. So 2.30. We get there early because it might sell out. Yeah, that was what made our week good. You're going to go see a circus? Sweet. 
What else made your week good? Yeah, spending time with your family. Truth. I asked you to tell the truth at the beginning, and you just told me true statements there about what has made your week good or what you're looking forward to doing. But sometimes mm, it's hard to tell the truth, isn't it? How many of you have a hard time telling the truth? Yeah, see, now you're really telling the truth. That's really good stuff, huh? How many of us have a hard time telling the truth, right? There we go. See, kids, you're in good company. Today we hear about one of the more interesting and complex characters from the story of Jesus' life, and that is Pontius Pilate. And he looked right at Jesus, and he said, What is truth? He really challenged him. Jesus knew it was a, a trap, and so he was quiet because even in him being silent before somebody that was trying to put him into a corner or get him to say something that wasn't true, he just let the silence convict Pilate. And there's something to that. Sometimes, boys and girls, instead of doing something that's not truthful or instead of saying something that's not truthful, just don't. Just say nothing. My grandfather used to say very little, my grandfather Kerr. In fact, every now and then he'd go, hmm. And it, somehow you knew when George said that, that he wasn't entirely in the same spot as you, but it was his kind way of not saying something he wished he hadn't said. You might even try that. Hmm. So next time you're tempted to not tell the truth, either say nothing or just, hmm, okay. Yeah, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our truth. Thank you for these wonderful children who can be the promise of truth. Help all of us as a church family to love them, to support them, to encourage them, and that even when they have a hard time being truthful, to encourage them back into your way, even as we do the exact same thing. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for coming down, guys. hearts and our minds be open to you, to know your truth and your way. Amen. This morning's scripture lesson is from John chapter 18, verse 28, through chapter 19, verse 16, which can be found on page 1,151 of the Pew Bible, as well as projected on the wall. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would be, not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? 
Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted to Together, a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail the king of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard the statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, Will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Holy God, help us to understand. Help us to connect and reconnect with your word that we have just heard. Help us to not be distracted, whatever's in our minds that could distract us. Help us to clearly be motivated by your spirit. Even in it, culture that has a hard time paying attention for a while. Help us to focus on what you want us to hear and do. Amen. Well, as you all know, throughout Lent, Lent we have been focusing upon a few of the people from Jesus' own story that jump out to us in Holy Scripture. We spent two weeks on Lazarus of Bethany, and then we talked about the difficult story of Judas Iscariot. We also reflected last week on Simon Peter. Today, our focus is Pontius Pilate. 
There are entire books written about Pontius Pilate, and I've always been fascinated with him. No doubt we all are fascinated with him because of the heightened role that he plays in Jesus' own life. I had the opportunity in college to portray Pontius Pilate in Andrew Lloyd Webber's Jesus Christ Superstar. I dreamed I met a Galilean most amazing man He had that look very rarely fine The haunting haunted kind I asked him to say what had happened how it all began I asked again he never said a word as if he hadn't heard and next the room was full of wild and angry men they seemed to hate this man they fell upon him and then they disappeared again then I saw thousands of millions crying for this man. And then I heard them mentioning my name and leaving me the blame. This song references scripture that we didn't actually read today. That's from Matthew chapter 27, 19, in which it's actually Pilate's wife, whether it's Hollywood or artistic license in theater, there's always some twist, that's okay. It's his wife that has the dream that warns her husband to do nothing or not associate with this just man. The song also depicts, doesn't it, that inner turmoil that's happening within Pilate's mind. There's something fascinating about the exchange that Pilate has with Jesus. When he first comes into contact with him, Jesus is eerily detached, the haunting, haunted kind. Yet even after being broken many, many times, insulted and rejected by his own people, Jesus still challenges Pilate eventually, doesn't he? And he says, the power that you have has been given to you from above. Now, of course, in this whole story, one of the greatest mysteries of it all is why it is that Jesus' own people, including the religious leaders who knew about the foretold Messiah, had Jesus killed. A theological answer, of course, to this mystery combines our Old Testament prophecy with our New Testament embodiment of Jesus being the very Lamb of God who takes upon the sins of the world. Yet, from a very practical perspective, the majority of this conflict can be explained as a power struggle. That's what it is. So often we are fascinated with the accumulation of power, aren't we? Power at any cost. And how to gain as much as possible. Yet in his dealings with the Roman governor of Judea, Jesus illustrates how truth 
trumps power. Truth trumps power. In saying even the power that you have has been given to you from above, Jesus reminds Pilate that no man's an island. No man's an island. The desire for power, friends, I believe is closely related to original sin. Sin in its origins. To have the very mind of God knowing evil from good. Ironic? No, I think not. Since birth, we have within us an unnatural, it's not how we were originally created, unnatural desire to dominate others. We want to be in power. Now, some might not share that publicly. Oh, I'm not like that. <laughs> Wait until they win the race, finish first in their class, or get that coveted promotion at work. The satisfaction of success is dangerously close to desire to dominate. It's close. That's why Major League Baseball fans call the Yankees organization the evil empire. Yes. Persons who aren't New York fans see the team's desire to purchase the best players at any price as greed, not sportsmanship. Case in point, up-and-coming 25-year-old Japanese pitcher Masahiro Takana, or Tanaka, there we go, I gotta get it, purchased in the off-season for a cool $175 million. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Power I don't like the Yankees, clearly. <laughs> Power struggles and displays of pride are nothing new, friends. And they aren't going anywhere. They're a permanent part of the human condition. The religious leaders felt threatened. Religious leaders. And the disciples then were developing this kind of confidence. Jesus' following was growing. Whether it was Caiaphas or Annas, different gospels tell it differently, who spoke for the Jews. Either way, the Pharisees felt vulnerable. And because of this, they took calculated measures to bring Jesus' influence to an end. The political leaders felt threatened. The Jews were developing confidence, their non-Roman leader, his charisma and his sway, it, it was spreading. It had all the signs of a civil war. The government center of Judea, Jerusalem, was in an upheaval. Thus, they too felt measures were needed to bring Jesus' influence to an end. And so here you have an unlikely alliance. The two groups worked to put into motion that which was foretold here in Scripture in many places, that he will be rejected by men, pierced by the Jews, and crushed by the Father. That he will die as a substitutionary sacrifice for sinners to provide forgiveness and salvation. Thus, it's a myth to place the death of Jesus upon any one person. Yet in Scripture and our creeds, one man receives more mention than others. One born at roughly the same time as Jesus of Nazareth, around the turn of the first century A.D. Yet he rose to power in a very different way by joining the Roman army as a teenager. In his 20s, he climbed to the position of commander. His name, Pilatus, would have been a nickname, suggesting he was skilled with a javelin. He was fierce in battle, and he was promoted for his powerful prowess. That's why he got where he got power 
displayed. Now, being appointed governor was definitely an honor. And it was an honor bestowed upon Pilate by Emperor Tiberius. However, Judah was a rough assignment. The good ones would have been Egypt or somewhere in Asia Minor. So from the very beginning, Pontius Pilate knew he was bound to be unliked by the locals in his role as Rome's legal and political enforcer. Thus, the atmosphere of Palm Sunday, which we're going to celebrate next week, only added to the anxiety of this young governor. During the annual Passover, thousands of people descended upon Jerusalem, Yet this year, word spread of a revolutionary whose message included that the Roman emperor was not God. Pilate had reason to be concerned. Yet Pilate, as scripture describes it, sees Jesus as more of a nuisance than anything else. He tells the chief priests, take him. Judge him. Crucify him yourselves. And then after asking Jesus if he thinks he's the king, Pilate does not conclude that he's a political threat. Aloof and suspicious, maybe, but not a political threat. Jesus tells Pilate, everyone who is of the truth listens to his voice. Jesus plainly places the authority of salvation upon himself and not upon our human hands. The truth then that sets all persons free from our bondage to sin and death is found in hearing and responding to the voice of Jesus. And now, as we would have it, the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus providing even us, Gentiles, a path of salvation. That is the miracle of miracles. Amen? Amen. Yet, have we heard? Have we responded to his voice? Or do other cries drowned out his own call. Pilate's answer to Jesus is classic. In fact, it's timeless. What is truth? I suspect that many of us would answer that question differently from one another if we were to do that this morning. In Superstar, Pilate adds, we both have truths. Are mine the same as yours? In John's gospel, Pilate once again reinforces his lack of finding guilt in the Galilean, and he even even opens up the escape clause in the law. All that was needed was public support. Yet when Pilate asks the crowd which of the prisoners that they would want released, their answer was Barabbas a murderer was set free and a healer was kept imprisoned. Once again, Pilate offers an inability to find fault in him, at which point the religious leaders, they're getting tired of this, they cry out, crucify him! It's here that the Gospel of John includes a very unique portion to the plot Jesus is escorted into a private room with Pilate. And the governor asks him from where he came, where do you come from? This is only in John's gospel. What do you think Pilate's motive was here? Scripture is silent as to what it was. but It sure gets one to wonder, doesn't it? When Jesus refuses to answer, Pilate pushes him, saying, 
Don't you know I have authority over to you? Either to release or to crucify you? And that's the point in which Jesus responds. I don't know how he did it. I'd like it if he was, but he was exhausted and beaten. Probably just simply said, power you have, it's been given to you from above. Now, it's worth recalling that the resurrected Jesus, remember this, in the Great Commission, he reminds his disciples that he's been given all authority, power, in heaven and on earth before he commissioned them to go into the world and teach his teachings and live the way in which he lived. Jesus is all powerful, all authority, yet Pilate tries to persuade him of his power over him, which is really rather comical. After Pilate attempts to let him go yet again, he accompanies him to the judgment seat. And here, in verse 13 of chapter 19, so when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and an Aramaic Gabbatha. Here, this is actually one of the more controversial pieces in this passage. Reread it later today, 1913. Why is it controversial? Who's the direct object? Who's sitting on the judgment seat? We don't know. Scholars are divided on this. Could Jesus have been mocked one last time by himself being seated at the place of judge? As the very people claimed, we have no king, judge, but Caesar. It's possible, but it's a mystery. What's not debatable is that ultimately the power-hungry pilot hands the servant leader, Savior, over to be executed. And that's the last we hear of Pilate. History proves that Pilate's career in Judea was short-lived. His leadership position was soon taken from him. Ironically, it was the religious and the political leaders who joined forces again, this time to oust him. Is it ironic? Under his leadership, you see, Pilate had a viaduct constructed, which sounds good in theory, getting water into the town. But he used temple funds secretly to support the project. And he had it built through a cemetery, making its water unclean and completely unusable to most there in Jerusalem. At the exact same time, his rule had become increasingly brutal, causing even his loyal servants to write back to Rome, this guy's losing his mind. Do something, Tiberius. The bottom line is that Tiberius terminated his governorship in December of 36 AD. And once back in Rome, he disappears. We don't know what happened to him. There's theories. Possibly he committed suicide. Yet every week in churches across the world, his name is recalled in either the Nicene or the Apostles' Creed. And if we're honest, many of us can relate to him. All those who have been tempted to put their jobs before their deeper convictions or wish to wash their hands of a sticky situation that seems dumped upon them, can relate to him. A final obvious question, which you've probably thought of yourselves, is whether Pilate could have known that he, not unlike Judas, played such a significant role in salvation's history. I don't know. Yet one more mystery. It's not clear whether Pilate ever confessed 
wrongdoing and putting Jesus to death. We don't know. However, there are legends that suggest he converted and even see, saw Jesus post-resurrection. I, I don't know about that. I can't be sure of those claims. But one thing I know, Pilate was deeply troubled by the experience of seeing that other 30-something-year-old leader who didn't seem motivated by power at all, but rather a quest for telling the truth. Interestingly, the Coptic Church of Egypt considers Pilate a saint. Believing he was overcome with grief for killing Jesus, Yet others believe him to be one of the most evil of men, giving him the credit for inspiring anti-Semitism. These two extremes alone leave us with more questions than answers concerning Pontius Pilate. But as we march towards Holy Week, at least we know all there is to know about Jesus, the one called King of the Jews. Or do we? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you, Bells. Let us pray together. Holy God, we come before you in prayer. We thank you for all that we've been reminded of today. And we, we rejoice, for we are people who look at the cross through resurrection. Even smiling through our own tears. Yet though it was so long ago, it's truth is still so present. Give us, Lord Jesus, in our own lives the ability to refrain from misspeaking the truth or twisting the truth. Help us to be people who, who know where the authority comes from and to not desire to grasp more power but knowing even the way in which our servant leader's life came to an end before it began again seeing in our own ways the way of the cross and not arrogantly thinking that we will be pain-free, trouble-free, worry-free millionaires because of a mission. God help those folks who think that, Lord. Help us to be united with those who are united around the same Jesus that we heard of today in Scripture that we've sung about today in song and who we've reflected upon today in word being preached. Help us to be united with our family members who love you. Help us to be united with our neighbors, our unknown neighbors to some of us who love you. Help us to be a tangible way in which the Holy Spirit works. Not in arrogance, but in honesty. Truth-telling in love. Pray prayers of thanksgiving for those who have been healed, for those whose lives have been restored, for those who have been inspired, for those who have hope that they didn't, for those who have worked hard with what you've given them, and they're making their way through this life, and they're giving you the glory. Thank you, God, for them. We pray that even as we reflect upon you in an intentional way in this season, that we would continue knowing full well the tension but continue, nonetheless, to do what you've taught us to do, even in the prayer in which you taught us to pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. to go to, although that's part of it, 
but a God that goes with and through you. If the Spirit has nudged and moves you, you will go where He goes. You will love and serve as He served. My prayer, our prayer here at First Presbyterian Church is that you see that act of faithfulness less as a religious mechanism through which you just always do the right thing and more as a freedom of expressing the grace that's been given to you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you today and always. Follow.